speaker, Jenny Gertz. Jenny is a certified genetic counselor, professor, and program director for the Master of Science in Genetic Counseling program at the Medical College of Wisconsin. She is part of a team of genetic experts at MCW Genomic Sciences and Precision, Precision Medicine Center and the Institute for Health and Equity, leading the way in genetic research, patient care, and community engagement and education designed to guide the early detection and prevention of disease. Please help me to welcome Jenny Gertz. Thank you, Paula, for the introduction, and um, thank you all for your time and attention today. Um, wow. Breathe. <laughs> Thanks for that reminder. Um, I have never felt imposter syndrome so much in my life than I do today because let me tell you, I've spoken in front of many audiences of academics and doctors and you know, very important people, but these are the most important people that we've heard from today. Um, so much heartfelt wisdom has been shared between last night and the speakers today, and I just have a tremendous amount of gratitude. Um, so thank you to everyone, thank you to the organizers that have done a wonderful job of putting together a truly transformative experience for myself and I suspect other attendees in the room today. And at such a pivotal time, we find ourselves two years into a seemingly endless pandemic <laughs> where our longing for human connection is palpable. Um, thank you for using the power of story to uplift, inspire, renew, and ignite us all. Um, I was asked to speak about genetic risk in family history, um, but much like the Cancer Stories program we saw last night that Mike Lawler put together, um, my presentation today is not my words and it's not my story. I'm here as a witness, um, as a vessel, and I can testify to what I've seen and what I've heard, but the power, the truth, and the wisdom, and the voices are for me to amplify and for me to learn from. They are not my own. <laughs> so um, with that, I'd like to just share a little bit about my plan for our time together. I'm only gonna share a little bit about risk assessment and risk reduction management strategies. What I really wanna focus on is overcoming barriers and hopefully we'll have a little time for discussion as well. I know I'm standing in between you and the lunch hour, um, so I'll make sure to finish on time. You're gonna give me like a signal or something? Like a shepherd's hook to pull me off. <laughs> um, but maybe some of the dis discussion can spill over um, into the lunch conversation. Um, and uh, actually, I was also wondering too, if possibly, um, I could share a little video of Sherry's story, the patient's story over the lunch hour, if that's possible. Um, thank you, okay. Um, my, my pa one of my uh, dear patients, Sherry, she couldn't be here today, but there's a recorded video that she has of her and her family that I think really um, fits well with the stories that we shared today. So if we have time to share that over the lunch break, I appreciate it. Um, so when patients come to me, uh, the question they ask their doctor is, you know, am, am I at higher risk? Well, I see this happening in my family. I see this happening around me. Well, what are my chances? Um, and I know there are folks here from all different backgrounds, so I've just got to review a few slides to make sure we're on the same page about how this all works. Uh, so as you know, cancer occurs because of genetic mutations that accumulate in the cells in our body. But not all cancer is inherited. Um, actually, most cancers are sporadic, uh, where all the cells start out working just fine, and the mutations are acquired over a person's lifetime. Um, that might be due to things like lifestyle, environment, and occupational exposures, viruses, or more commonly just chance, or things that we don't know or understand yet. So my role as a genetic counselor is to focus on that hereditary and familial component to cancers. So familial cancers where we believe the cancer is multifactorial, caused by a combination of shared environment, lifestyle, and some moderate genetic influences as well we don't quite yet understand exactly how those genes and environment interplay to increase risk, many of those factors are still being discovered for that portion of the pie there. My main clinical focus is on that 10% that are hereditary, where we can perform genetic testing 
typically on a blood sample, to look at the DNA that someone inherited from each of their parents to see if that gene mutation is present which predisposes them to cancer. Additional acquired mutations are still necessary before someone develops cancer because it's not cancer, just that one mutation. And that can still be influenced by environment and lifestyle. But with hereditary cancer, that first hit, if you will, is present from conception. So the individual is a higher risk because they're already a step into that process when they are born. So this here, that 10%, that hereditary cancer, that's our opportunity, our opportunity for prevention and early detection that we don't get often with other types of cancers. And characteristics of these hereditary cancers um, include what I call the EMU. So I do, I give this talk to medical students, so I put animals on there so they remember these things, because they gotta remember a lot of things, right? So the EMU, so the E is earlier than expected age of diagnosis. The new recommendations now are every woman who's diagnosed with breast cancer under 50 should be offered genetic testing. If there's multiple individuals in the family that have the same type or related types of cancers, or someone that gets a second primary cancer, so breast cancer in one breast and then in the other breast. And we heard mentioned through some of these stories some of the cancers that can be genetically related. Breast, ovarian, prostate, and pancreas can be genetically linked. Colon and endometrial cancer can be genetically linked. And then the U is for uncommon cancer. So cancers that aren't as highly prevalent, if we see them in a family, regardless of age, regardless of family history, we recommend a referral to genetics. So breast cancer is common, of course, in females, but in men it's uncommon, and that automatically warrants a referral. Same with prostate cancer, unfortunately, very common cancer, but metastatic, aggressive prostate cancer is not common, and we do like to see those folks in genetics because there's things that we can offer for more effective treatment. All individuals with ovarian cancer are recommended to see genetics, along with all individuals with pancreas cancer. And of course, if there's already a known genetic mutation in the family, we see those individuals as well. And importantly, these um, EMU statements that are or, any one of these things would qualify someone for genetics. But the problem is, um, we see individuals that have what we call limited family structure, that are not going to be able to meet these criteria because maybe they're adopted, or there was a gamete donation, or they were raised by a single parent and don't know one side of the family or they're an immigrant who had to flee a war-torn country displacing various family members not knowing the details of their medical history. So because we have these policies in place written that determine who does and doesn't get genetic testing based on their family history, and these policies written by insurance companies and professional societies, it automatically creates a disparity for anyone who doesn't know their complete family history. In addition to family history, the tools we use to assess risk include genetic testing. Um, the technology's come a very long way. Just in the last five years, uh, we offer something called a gene panel test, where we can analyze dozens, even hundreds of genes all at once in a fraction of the time and a fraction of the cost that it used to take. However, we still have not discovered all of the gene mutations that may cause a predisposition to cancer. So in some cases, we're offering DNA banking for future use when our technology improves. And I imagine that most of you have interacted with genetic counselors in one way or another, but I'll just give you a short background for those that may be unfamiliar. The basic definition of genetic counseling is the process of helping people understand and adapt to the medical, psychological, and familial implications of genetic contributions to disease. And in a typical appointment, um, every patient's unique, so things are always a little bit different, but we, we usually get about 30 to 60 minutes with our patients in a session, so we really have time to hear their story and explore if genetic testing's right for them. That's one of the things I love about my job, that time with the patient to listen and learn. And for each patient, what we try to do is establish mutual goals for our time together and set expectations for the appointment. Uh, we'll review their medical history and spend time talking about their family history. Uh, we're able to use that information to create what's called a personalized risk assessment for each patient and review what their genetic testing options might be. We try to have a balanced conversation about what makes sense for the patient you know, medically, emotionally, financially, um, as far as their genetic testing options and give them the opportunity and information to make a decision about testing that's ultimately gonna be best for them and their family. 
In this informed consent conversation, we cover risks, benefits, and limitations of genetic testing. We address any insurance concerns and provide information about the protections in place to prohibit genetic discrimination. And then we provide some anticipatory guidance around possible results. Um, through all this, we're trying to help the patient navigate any psychological or psychosocial impact of the genetic testing for themselves and their family members, making referrals to behavioral health where appropriate. So I hear a lot of stories from patients about their reasoning and, and decisioning as they're pursuing testing or considering um, their options. And some reasons patients provide to not pursue testing is that we don't really have effective detection or prevention options for all cancer types. Um, so for example, hearing the story last night about the brain tumor, if someone's at a higher risk for brain tumor, it's hard to know what sort of screening and treatments we can offer them for early detection. Um, there's more technologies that are coming out and some exciting hope for the future, but ultimately, if we give a patient information that they're at risk for something and there's nothing they can do about it, that information can be a lot to bear. And so kind of related to that, that some folks don't want to know the information because they feel that the knowledge is a burden for them. Other folks, it's just not a good time. They're unprepared to learn that result, particularly the individuals I see that are right in the midst of a brand new cancer diagnosis. They feel like one more piece of information could be um, detrimental to, the, to their health, both physically and mentally. And some folks, it's their personality type or just where their emotional well-being is at, um, at that time. And then when I talk with folks about their reasons to pursue testing, um, many of the folks that I see, um, you know, they're here because they want to do something. They want to be proactive about their health. They've heard from a healthcare provider about the options for early detection and risk reduction. Um, and, and many folks that are in, in that group also may feel that knowledge is power and they want to know. They want to be empowered by the information because they can do something about it. Um, and what's been happening most recently um, in many different cancer types uh, with something called precision medicine is the actual genetic test results can impact the cancer treatment. So we're seeing patients very early in their diagnosis. Sometimes I see patients the same day they find out they have cancer. And I'm trying to explain genetics <laughs> and genetic testing and some complicated things. So we really have to figure out and create a priority around what information is important right now, what information can I provide later, because I can tell they're already all overwhelmed, um, and how do I help them make a decision because you know, their doctor's saying, I need you to have this genetic test so we know what surgery to do, or we know what chemotherapy to offer. And one of the stories that I hear, I think about often my patient who I'd, I'd seen her um, seven years prior, and she called me up one day and said, remember me? <laughs> and I said, vaguely. <laughs> um, and she, you know, I looked up her chart, oh yeah, I remember you decided not to pursue testing. And she said, yeah, well, my kids are going to be about that age. I'm ready now. So timing can be a big part of it, and a lot of times children motivate that. Um, and again, going back to that good time, like that readiness, some people have to be prepared to hear those results. And sometimes it's just that personality and emotional well-being. It's a good, it's a good time, and they're in a good place mentally to receive these results. So those are some of my patient stories around the decisions to pursue genetic testing or not. Um, and the, like I said, the um, real important part of the powerful part about this is that people feeling like the information is only powerful if they can do something about it. Um, so folks are often eager to learn about their options for lowering their risk or enhancing screening to find cancer at an early, more treatable stage. So um, I'm just going to cover this real briefly because we actually heard about some real great examples here throughout the patient stories as well. Um, but approaches to risk reduction and management for our patients that um, we see and, and go through genetic testing include um, screening. So there's tests that can find cancer in earlier stages when it's more treatable. Um, so for example, more early or more frequent colonoscopies or breast MRI, we heard about that technology today. Um, there are medications that can be given before cancer <coughs> develops to lower the risk for cancer. Um, an example of tamoxifen, which is yes, a cancer treatment, but can also be given preventatively. And then prophylactic or risk reduction surgeries to prevent cancer. So for women that are at a higher risk for breast cancer, they're often also at a higher risk for ovarian cancer. So that preventative removal of the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. 
And as I mentioned with our advances in understanding of the genomic changes in cancer, medications have been developed that target certain genetic pathways, making treatment more effective for folks with certain genetic mutations. So all of these become options um, as we uh, explore the, the possibilities through genetic testing. And I'm gonna skip over any more specific examples in the interest of time. I'm, I'm sure many of you have personal experiences or know someone who's been in these situations. Because uh, what I really wanted to focus on um, was the barriers. You know, it seems so straightforward. It just outlined how it works, right? We identify people at risk. We offer them genetic testing. If they're at high risk, they get early detection and, and risk reduction options. What could be so hard about that? <laughs> um, and, you know, there have been some progress. And so um, in 2013, it was a big year in cancer genetics. Um, I know my friend Christina, another genetic counselor in the audience here, remembers 2013. It was, maybe that's what we should get a tattoo about, 2013. <laughs> um, it was a big year. Uh, first thing that happened in May, um, Angelina Jolie, I never thought Angelina Jolie would change my professional life, but she did. Um, she told the world about her prophylactic bilateral mastectomy because she had tested positive for a BRCA1 gene mutation that was running in her family. Um, we saw referrals for genetic counseling and genetic testing for breast cancer increase by 50%, and that continued on after the announcement, something that was dubbed the Angelina Jolie effect and actually was studied and researched. This removed some of the stigma and shame that had been previously present around genetics and created a public conversation about hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. So the awareness increased, and that certainly helped. The second thing that happened that year, a month later, the US Supreme Court decision declaring that myriad genetics patent on the BRCA genes, which had been in place for nearly two decades, was invalidated. The high court's opinion that genes exist in nature and are not patentable, brilliant. Um, <laughs> prior, to that, prior to that, there was one lab in the nation that could do the testing, and they charged $4,000 to test for two genes. By noon that day, the decision uh, of the decision, it was on a Thursday, it, it was 